So we are here with uh, Professor James Scott. He's uh, Emeritus Sterling Professor of Political Science and uh, Anthropology at uh, Yale University. And we are here with him at his house on a farm. It's, it's a beautiful house and uh, we're going to ask a few questions uh, related to the Southeast and Studies at Yale University. Okay. Good to see you here. Happy to be here. The first question we have is, how did you first become interested in Southeast Asia? I had no interest in Southeast Asia as an undergraduate. Uh, I went to Williams College and I was an honor student in economics. And uh, actually I was assigned an honors thesis topic on German wartime mobilization um, by my professor whom I admired a great deal. And I had, I had come from a very tiny little Quaker school near Philadelphia um, and I felt badly prepared. So I had worked very, very hard for the first three years at Williams. Uh, and then I finally realized after my third year that I was doing okay. And I relaxed and I fell in love and I didn't do any work on my thesis in my senior year, in my first semester. And the professor called me in and asked me what I had, uh, how much progress I'd made on my honors thesis. And I tried to, uh, I had done a little work, but not much. And he understood that I hadn't done much work. And he said, get out. You're not going to do a thesis with me um, because you haven't done your own work. Uh, and I realized that if I were to graduate with honors in economics, which I wanted to do, um, that I had to find another economics professor to adopt me as an orphan, right? And so I knocked on the doors of several professors. And I think the third one I knocked on was a man named William Hollinger, who had worked on Indonesia. <clears throat> and he said, you know, I've always wanted to know more about Burmese economic development. And I had taken some classes in economic development. And he said, if you work on Burmese economic development, I will adopt you. Mm. So I did a thesis on Burmese economic development. And that was, it was essentially an analysis of the Knappen, Tibbet, Abbots, and McCarthy uh, report on the first five-year plan for the UNU government after yes. the Second World War. Um, that, anyway, uh, and so I, because I didn't know what to do with my life, um, I applied and was accepted at uh, Harvard Law School, uh, but since I had done a thesis on Burmese economic development, I also applied for a Rotary Fellowship to Burma, mm -hmm. and I got both of them, and I had to decide what to do, and I decided I can always do Harvard Law School, but well, here's my chance to go to Burma. So mm -hmm. I spent a whole year in Burma, and that's how I became a Southeast Asianist. So not a very, not a very deliberate <laughs> history, but sort of by accident I stumbled into being a Southeast Asianist, and I and of course, my year in Burma was absolutely it was my first real experience abroad, and I fell in love with the place in a hundred ways. Going off of your year in Burma, can you sort of elaborate on like where exactly you worked? Can you briefly touch on your experience and research while in the country? Well, um, being trained as an economist, it is all about numbers. <laughs> and so, uh, I, you may not recall, but the Rangoon University Economics Department was very distinguished. Um, it, it had uh, eight was it Eichan and La Mient, a famous uh, yes, Burmese agree. economist, were there. So I felt I was in very good hands. And so I spent the first two months in the library doing statistical series of economic development. Uh, and then I thought, this is crazy. I'm in Burma and I'm spending all my time in a library. Uh, just looking at uh, pieces of paper with numbers on them and I'm not uh, learning and so I then I've, I decided to drop that altogether and I started 
getting involved actually in student politics at Rangoon University Student Union. I was interested. I was a political activist as an undergraduate. Uh, I would, grew up in a left-wing socialist family. Um, and um, uh, so I spent a fair amount of time. And this was a time actually when I got to know a number of um, Karen activists um, in Cumberland, right? Uh, yes. Who had family there and uh, one named Charlemagne Thla, uh, and who helped me buy a motorcycle. I had a 1940 Triumph motorcycle. And um, anyway, I decided to explore Burma. I, but I was in, interested in the student politics. I, I got a couple of threatening letters from uh, people who thought I was interfering in student politics from uh, also from Rangoon University Student Union activists, and I was slightly afraid I was going to get beaten up, actually. Um, and so halfway through the year, I decided to move to Mandalay, uh, and I went to the new staff chummery in Mandalay, um, and I spent most of my time with Burmese friends uh, on my motorcycle going all over northern Burma and um, uh, and so on. So I got to see the countryside, um, but I didn't, I didn't do any research. I just spent my time falling in love with the country. Just to come back to sort of your work experience, you do have experience being a professor at Yale and being heavily involved with the Southeast Asian Department. So could you sort of explain how you transitioned into actually contributing to the Southeast Asian Department? After Burma, I spent a year in Paris working for the National Student Association. And then I was elected vice president of the U.S. National Student Association. And their offices were in Philadelphia. So there were two more years in which I was involved in student activism and civil rights uh, issues. Um, and uh, after that, I had applied. Uh, first to Yale economics, and then I decided I wanted to do political science at Yale. Uh, but I did not get, um, I had some courses from uh, Harry Bender in the history department, and Carl Pelzer, who was a geographer, and Paul Moose, who was an anthropologist who worked on Southeast Asia, mostly Vietnam. Um, and so I got a little bit of that, but basically I was trained as a political scientist, and then I got a job in um, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. Yes. And I taught there for eight years, and I was interested in Southeast Asia. I was involved there in the Southeast Asian program, and I, you'll recall, this is... I started at Wisconsin in 1967 and came back to Yale in 1976. But the period I was in Wisconsin was the Vietnam War and the protests against the Vietnam War. So being a Southeast Asianist was very uh, crucial in those moments and I was against the war in Vietnam. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time doing, again, political activism against the war in Vietnam. Uh, and that, I think, may turned me into a real Southeast Asianist. And I decided, I taught a class with someone at Wisconsin, a very important person intellectually in my life, Edward Friedman. Um, and we taught a class on theories of peasant uh, revolution. Mm -hmm. And we had 600 students. Uh, in the class because it was this, wow. such an important period um, and it was a very contentious class with uh, uh, a group of students wrote criticisms of each of our lectures and handed them out to the students at the next session. So it was uh, quite an amazing period. And I decided then that I wanted to devote my intellectual career to peasants. That is to say, peasants are the most numerous class in world history. And 
if development doesn't mean anything for peasants, then the hell with development. Um, so I decided to make myself into a peasantist uh, and to read all the classical literature on peasants, to read as much about Southeast Asian peasants as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually that resulted in a book called The Moral Economy of the Peasant. That's right, yeah. And at the center of that was a comparison between the Sayasan Rebellion in the 1930s in, in Burma and the Ne Tin uprising at the same time in Vietnam. It was archival research and I wanted to understand why peasants rebelled. Uh, what uh, drove them to these dangerous uh, acts. Uh, and so, so it was the Vietnam War and that class uh, and my desire to work on peasants, not just Southeast Asian peasants, but it meant reading all the classical European literature on peasants as well. Uh, so I just, so you could say that I'm, I was a peasantist mm -hmm. uh, rather than a Southeast Asianist, a peasantist with an interest in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. rather than a Southeast Asianist with an interest in peasants. So, um, looking at that, the peasant resistance, particularly a and rebellion in the 1930s, which is, I mean, colonial period. So, what you will see the connections between his rebellions in the 1930s and the current resistance movement in, in, in Myanmar. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, that's that's a good question, but I because uh, I haven't thought about, uh, in a sense, the the argument, the argument about both the Sayasan Rebellion and the Nathan Rebellion is that the colonial regimes in Burma and in Vietnam were interested in uh, the stability of their income extraction from the countryside. And so you had this phenomenon called the head tax, right? It's the easiest tax. I mean, just every person pays the same amount of tax. And in a village with so many population, they're responsible for paying so much tax. It's their problem how to divide up the contributions in the village, right? Um, but the point is that the government always tries, this is true today too, governments always try to insulate their income from the fluctuations of harvests and the economy and so on. And so um, I think the insight, if there was an insight in the moral economy of the peasant, is that what mattered to peasants was not how much the government took from them, uh, but it was how much was left for them at the end of the day. So if you had a period when you had bad harvests, right, and the government was collecting the same amount of tax, that was explosive because you couldn't eat, right? And so this was a question of subsistence security uh, and so on. The current rebellion against the government uh, in Myanmar seems to be so much more political than subsistence, right? That is to say, um, it, subsistence problems are going to increase just because of the suffering that people are going through, I understand. Um, but it seems to me that, and and that's something I'm waiting to read the great book about, someone else must write, that 10 years from, 19, from 2010 to 2020, and uh, no censorship, the newspapers, the public opinion, uh, the social media, and so on, you created a kind of open democratic culture, a sense of possibilities, a sense that things were headed in the right direction. And it seems to me that um, all of that came crashing down with the coup, um, the, the military coup in 21. Uh, and so it foreclosed all of these possibilities and the, the government the government's brutality uh, in just shooting people and so on um, has created a, a kind of popular mobilization that is only partly uh, controlled by uh, the NLD and the National Unity Government, but is in fact uh, autonomously 
coming from village after village after village, and for the first time, as you know, as well as I do, for the first time, the, it's the Burman population, right? Um, yes. That is also learning what life was like for the ethnic minorities uh, for the 30 or 40 years when they weren't paying any attention That's right. to that. And so it seems to me that now the government faces not just an ethnic rebellion at the frontiers, which it has been facing for uh, half a century, um, but it's now facing the determined opposition of much of its own population, particularly in the Sagai, Pakoku, uh, Maguay areas. Your involvement with Asia has sort of been like, throughout the years, really focused on the rebellion and resistance of the people. And so how has your interest, especially from Vietnam War to the coup in Myanmar, how has it evolved throughout the years? And how do you think other people's interests as well evolved in focusing on current events happening in Southeast Asia? Well, it's an indirect answer, I suppose. So when I decided I wanted to study peasants, the first thing that was important was a decision that I, if I wanted to devote my life to peasants, then I had to become an anthropologist and I had to live in a peasant village for a year and a half at least in order to understand what peasant life was like. Um, and at that point it was impossible to go to Burma. Um, and I ended up going to a rice village in Malaysia uh, and writing a book called Weapons of the Week. Um, and, uh, and then a larger book called Domination and the Arts of Resistance. So it was an effort to sort of understand. Um, uh, David knows a lot about uh, domination in the arts of resistance. By the way, I use it for my for my right. teaching course at Solid State Divinity School. So, but the but the point is that um, I I left intellectually. I left political science and became an anthropologist with the idea that. You have to understand the granular daily life uh, of the people you're studying. I mean, that is to say, if you're interested in understanding why people do what they do, the first thing you must do is to ask them why they're doing what they do, right? That is to say, that's the sort of, the, it's not that they always tell the truth, it's not that they're not mystified themselves and so on, but if you don't start asking them, for their best explanation of why they're doing what they're doing, you are not a social scientist. And so it seems to me anthropology, that basic question of anthropology, of starting from the lived subjective experience of the people whose activities you are studying, if you don't start there, I'm not paying any attention to you at all. And so in that respect, I became an anthropologist. Um, the, Later on, I, I came to realize more and more that anthropology uh, needs history uh, to be, that is to say, anthropology and history belong together. The historians don't have the granular things that anthropology has, and anthropology uh, is likely to be shallow historically, right? And together, they can make a very uh, powerful pair. Um, and so the, um, I did that work, that anthropological work, um, in my first couple of years at Yale, my first four years at Yale. I spent actually two years in a row um, uh, on leave uh, in the field. And that's when um, I then started teaching courses on peasants and on Southeast Asia, and that's when, uh, with some colleagues at Yale who were interested in peasants uh, also, mostly in Asia, Bill Kelly in anthropology, Helen Sue, um, uh, uh, the Bob Harms in history worked on Africa. Um, anyway, we we began to teach this seminar on the comparative studies of agrarians societies and uh, 
out of that grew the program in agrarian studies. And so yeah. you could say, as I said, I'm a, an anthropologist with interest in Southeast Asia. You could say I'm a presentist with mm -hmm. an interest in Southeast Asia. You can also say I'm an agrarianist with an interest in Southeast Asia. So I've, um, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand rural, rural life culture, um, crops, um, uh, and so, uh, yes, I've, I've tried to remain close to the ground and uh, you are in a chair with uh, a, um, a sheepskin from my uh, 20 years as a raiser of sheep, uh, <laughs> which I then uh, sold to uh, Yale faculty, right, <laughs> as meat, right, uh, yeah. and so on. So for 20, 22 years I was a sheep breeder as well here, yeah. so I tried to practice a little agriculture as well as mm -hmm. teaching about it. Although you are not um, the founder of Southeast Asian Studies at Yale, we understand, but you have been involved in these Southeast Asian Studies at Yale for many, many years as a student and later as a faculty. So what do you think um, can Yale uh, improve these Southeast Asian Studies? Well, um, it's interesting to me that the Vietnam War I would have expected that the Vietnam War would have produced many centers for Southeast Asian studies, but it did not. Um, somehow, the problem with South, there's a structural problem with Southeast Asian studies. The, the structural problem with Southeast Asian studies is that unlike China studies or unlike Indian studies, you have six or seven classical civilizations each with languages that are completely different and, could not, and are not mutually uh, intelligible. Intelligible. You can't speak Khmer and have an Indonesian understand you. You can't speak Burmese and have a Thai understand you. You can't speak Philippine and you know uh, Tagalog um, and have a Vietnamese understand you. Uh, so the point, is, and most of Southeast Asia had different metropolitan countries during the colonial period, right? Um, yes. That is to say, uh, the Dutch in the case of Indonesia, the, the England in the case of um, Malaysia uh, and Burma, France in the case of Vietnam. So, in a sense, the studies of these countries, uh, moving between these countries, requires you to learn a new language, requires you to um, uh, do a completely different uh, history, re requires you to... Um, um, Kind of understand a different classical literature uh, and poetry and culture, and so that means that um, the unity of Southeast Southeast Asia is a geographical expression. That's true. Uh, and so it's it's a it's rather artificial, and I mean there are some things that Southeast Asia has in com in common, like uh, a set of culinary things, a set of connections by trade, and so on. But it's not a culturally unified area. And so therefore, the structural problems of creating Southeast Asian studies are particularly difficult um, because people are tied to, let's say, French colonial studies if they're working on Vietnam, and so on. So how you improve this, I'm not actually quite sure. Um, but what I am certain of is that what you a, a good Southeast Asian program has to offer the major languages uh, of the region, which is four or at least four or five languages. And I think it's absolutely crucial that undergraduates and graduate students who want to do work in that area have an exposure by actually visiting the area and spending some time there so they get somehow to know the terrain and so on.